record. And I want to introduce Miss Sherry. She is here to rock and roll and show you everything you never needed to know. It's all yours, <laughs> darling. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Can I go ahead and share the screen? It's your screen. Okay. And sorry about the, the thumbnails over to the left. Um, we can't share <coughs> screen with it in, what's it called? Presentation mode. Um, otherwise it cuts the slides in half. So we're just gonna go with that. And if you don't know me, my name is um, Sherry Hammond. I'm originally from Georgia. I started in this uh, photography industry in the mid 80s. Um, I started out as a hairdresser and did that for um, a year until I found out I had horrible allergies to almost everything. So um, I had to quit that and was looking for something else. And there was a photography studio in Augusta, Georgia. Um, they were one of the, the biggest in the Southeast his name was Robert Sims. I know, um, Michael, I don't know if you knew him or not. Um, That's before my time. He, um, he was one of the pioneers uh, with doing children, um, children's programs where the children come back uh, three, six, nine, 12 months, and then um, every six months until they start school. And then once a year, once they start school and that kind of uh, a program. And they needed a salesperson and I was um, found out really quickly I'm not a good salesperson um, so they moved me to a production where they would do stuff um, like put orders together put proof boxes together um, cut mats all that kind of fun stuff and so I did that until Mr. Sims found out that I had an art background and asked me if I was interested in retouching and the reason he asked is he had an older lady who uh, was not well and was ready to retire and move back to South Africa. So she taught me um, what she felt like uh, teaching me. She was not much of a people person. Um, but then Mr. Sims started sending me to um, GPPA school, um, Georgia school. It was um, it's been an affiliate school, kind of like the West Coast School, um, for a long, long time. It's one of the oldest affiliate schools that are that's still going. Um, went there and went back year after year. Um, I learned negative retouching, print retouching, airbrushing for copy restoration. Then when Photoshop came along, learned Photoshop and then Corel Painter and then started teaching there. So um, it's this is something that I've done for a long, long time. Um, in this particular program, um, my business um, is I do painted portraits for other professional photographers. They send me their portrait files and I do the work in Corel Painter. Um, and depending on the type of image, I'll print it on either canvas or um, a heavy matte fine art paper. And then for the canvas, um, they can also um, commission embellishment on top of the canvas as well. And then I stretch it and send it back and they have a finished piece. So my program um, is kind of what is possible with uh, Corel Painter and what you can do with an image. Um, and then I'm gonna give you some tips on selling these because um, a lot of people are kind of at a loss um, now that they are they're doing it or they're offering it um, on where to go from there how to sell them um, so I'm gonna go through a lot of befores and afters some are more dramatic than others um, but they're really interesting to look at to see what is possible um, for your clients whether you uh, do this yourself or uh, you have someone else do it um, and I'm gonna start with this one this particular photographer um, She's act. If you're a country music fan, Luke Bryan, um, this is Luke Bryan's aunt. I do her, the paintings for her. She lives in South Georgia. Um, she w wanted uh, this little girl, uh, but she wanted a few changes. She wanted her head tilted more straight up instead of um, over to the side a little bit more, and a more dramatic sky added instead of a white sky. So this 
this is what we um, ended up with. And if you notice, there's a lot of accent colors in here as well. I love to, to pop accent colors in. It just gives the image more interest, more sparkle and more life. Um, you can see in the whites, I've got blues in the shadows and warmer colors towards the um, more mid-tone to highlights. And same in the water, um, that will take your photographic image a lot farther uh, to a believable painting instead of just um, painting what the colors and tones that are already there. So while I am using the photograph as my base, I'm going in and, and hand painting in different tones and different, different colors and different textures. This one is also um, a photographer on um, the east coast of Georgia on the beach. Um, she had a little bit of an exposure problem, um, so I did some work on this um, to get the water back and his shirt back and give it a little bit more of a warm sky um, to give this little guy a, a, a little bit, bit nicer surrounding. And this one doesn't have so much of a dramatic change. It's a studio shot with um, this sweet little girl, um, tone down the, the darkness in the background a little bit. Um, here again, um, you can probably, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but um, blues and shadows, warms and highlights and stuff like that. Um, just a nice painted portrait, uh, more of a classic style. Here's another one of this little uh, of another little girl um, from another Georgia photographer. Most of my clients come from the south and the southeast, um, even though I've been here almost nine years. Um, this this seems to be something that um, southern people um, have a little bit more um, a desire for. Um, I'm not sure why, um, but that's just how it is for me. Um, and then we've got this next one, pretty senior on these stairs. And you can also notice there's a, a lot of deep greens and lighter greens um, that are a little bit of a distraction. And also in the stairs, so I kind of evened everything um, out, not flat, but not as distracting so that the girl stands out a little bit more. And if anybody has any questions, along the way, feel free to ask. This image of this, uh, these two cute little girls on this porch, I gave the background a little bit more tone because they're, um, the highlights in the background are just a little bit um, light and pretty close to being blown out. So I just gave it a little bit more tone and a little bit more color. And this little boy standing in this um, tree-lined road, it's uh, such a pretty framing device to have trees like this. And so I just did a, a lot of uh, blending and color work uh, back there. Um, if you've ever had art classes in, in color theory, cool colors recede. And so that's why I love to put a lot of blues in the backgrounds like that, just to give it a little bit more of a, a feeling of um, those trees receding into the background. And I also toned down um, a lot of the, the highlights, the specular highlights on um, objects in the background and lightened up a, a few of those really dark trunks and limbs just to make um, your attention go right to that little boy. Jerry, when you're doing these, um, about how long does it take you to do to paint a portrait like this? Well, it depends on it, on the image. If it's just a head and shoulders or a three quarter with a pretty simple background, um, maybe an hour, hour and a half. Um, but I have done some that I've worked on all day that will uh, that was a large family, um, and especially if 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 it's an environmental and there's there's several people in it and you've got trees and bushes and fences and iron gates and stuff like that the more stuff that's in it the longer it's going to take this one probably took uh, about three or four hours by the time i was done so i do um, i do some retouching work um 
in Photoshop before I take it into Corel Painter, just um, a lot of times will make my job a lot easier if it's already done before I bring it into Painter, but really depends on the image. I hope that helps. That does. <laughs> This image, um, this is from a family group um, from one of Dennis's clients. It was for a family group, um, but the wife decided to have this painting done of Russell, the bulldog, um, as a Christmas present for her husband. And we just isolated him out of the group. Um, I gave him um, a really pretty neutral background and this is what we ended up with. And they went with a 24 by 24 gallery wrap of uh, Mr. Russell here. This little girl, she's super cute and um, nice image. The photographer was not happy because the time of day, um, the client was, um, this was the only time that they could come um, so the background is, is pretty dark um, and their lights, of course, weren't going to carry that far back. So it looks like there's a big, deep, dark hole back there. So I lightened it up and it looks really weird on this laptop monitor. I'm not sure if it does for you too. The background looks a little odd here, um, but it really doesn't in real life. Um, just lightened up the darkness, gave it... Um, a more light and airy tone, and not that she's um, standing in front of this um, dark abyss. I um, got rid of some uh, distracting elements in the background. Um, just kind of deepened and darkened the blues in her dress and in her bow. And the wildflowers, they um, just accentuated the colors in that as well. And this is what um, we ended up with this one. This one was a fun one. This particular photographer does a lot of uh, fairy themed images and um, her paintings are always a lot of fun to do. These two little girls in their little fairy outfits with their unicorn and this beautiful um, area that she has found. Um, and I went in and just to make the horse stand out a little bit more, I really blended the leaves that are in the middle um, that's in the super way far uh, background. Um, we know that they're there, but we don't need to see the detail. So that really makes that horse, um, or excuse me, unicorn um, stand out. And just some really, really pretty pieces that, that, we, uh, that we do for her. Another classic children's portrait, um, just popping in some color and tone here and there and um, giving some blues and purples again. And you can see in that green chair, uh, there's a lot of warm colors in the highlights and then more cool colors in the, in the shadows. That gives it um, a lot of depth as well. This one was a pretty a dramatic difference. Um, on the beach, southeast, Southeast Georgia. This is one of the probably most photographed uh, photographers' children ever, uh, this particular client of mine. And she's just now graduating. So I have been painting this child's portrait since she was a, a tiny little thing. And now she's, um, she's graduating this year. And you can see I took out the jetty and I took out all those posts and things, um, gave it a uh, dramatic sky to kind of tie in with the, the rough waves. Um, then they ended up um, doing a 30 by 40 of this. And this particular client always does the oil paint enhancements as well. So it was a really pretty piece. This was another um, dramatic one as well, but this client knew what I would be able to, to do for her. Um, they wanted it to look like, um, kind of a, a Tuscan villa type of feel. So um, I darkened uh, the grass area and filled in the, the, there's a little sidewalk there. So I just filled that in, added the wildflowers, added the, the stucco look to the wall and to the floor, um, added the pot and the flowers in the pot. And 
I, I talked her into the solid color dress because that crazy dress, uh, uh, and I'm glad that she agreed because that was just, that was super crazy. Um, it, generally, when we do painted portraits, we really try to stress, at least for us, that uh, they do solids. Um, if you wear, if your client wears patterns, then the clothes are going to be the, more of the subject than they are, and that kind of takes over the, the piece. And so I did red and balanced it with red on either side. Um, it's kind of like a triangle composition there, and they were really happy with it. This was another really fun one. This photographer had a decorator client that was working with their client. They were building a new home and the decorator sent color swatches to the photographer who then sent them to me. And they were all these neutral tones that's in this background. And this is the customer's horse. Um, I used another head from another image that's not in here, but it is the body. Uh, of the horse and just completely changed up the background to make it more of a fine art piece and instead of a um, this kind of documentary type image of this horse with the colors that they wanted and this is hanging in the decorator's client's home. Oops, where'd I go? Another pretty little girl with their uh, pretty frilly dresses. And as you can see, uh, I got rid of the big out of focus piece of shrubbery that's on the bottom right corner, just because it's taken up a fairly large amount of space and it's out of focus. And so that just really pulls the eye. So I just totally got rid of it, painted in um, what was already there, just extended it and also uh, painted the super highlights in the background a little bit darker. Um, that way they don't stand out so much and gave the dress a little bit more tone. And here again, a lot of accent colors here and there just to give it some life. This particular image, um, the photographer had the girl seated to begin with and forgot to move the background light. And so you can see in the before image, um, it's at her hips instead of where it should be. Um, so I went in and changed that as well. Um, kind of gave her the background light around her head and shoulders where it should be and eliminated it from around her hips. And also gave her um, an arm um, where she really didn't have one before. And also that rug um, was a really big distraction. Um, it's really super patterned and a, a lot of contrast. So I just blended all that together just to make it um, a little bit more muted and a little bit less detail and contrasty. And this is something that I do a lot of is this particular client, um, they could not get the little boy, the little boy in the blue and the white is the one that they were trying to get a portrait of and he just would not cooperate without the older brother being there. So it turned into a session with the two brothers together. And of course the little boy on the left was not dressed for it. And we gave him uh, a shirt that works and a background that works. And so this is uh, a lot of, um, collaboration on the part of the photographer and myself uh, for what we can come up with. So we kind of saved this for the mom. Didn't help that they didn't get anything of the little boy, the younger one by himself, but they got a really nice portrait of the, the younger one. This was a senior image um, sent to me by a photographer in uh, Mississippi. Um, she does a ton of seniors and this particular girl um, she loved the image. They weren't crazy about the background. So of course I did um, a little bit of darkening and just blended all that back together to be seamless and really accented the, the soft grass and really made her stand out in this image. Here's another one that uh, the photographer didn't get exactly what they wanted. They had a lot of color cast 
um, from the sun and some reflection on some trees that were super yellow. So we've got a lot of yellow on the girl's face on the before image on the left and on her hands. So we toned all that down, uh, made this a head and shoulders, moved her arm and came up with a, with a much nicer portrait of this little girl than the original. Here's another image where time of day uh, was a factor in the way back, um, dark background back there, I lightened it up and uh, they wanted some hydrangeas filled in a little bit on that bare left side. So I, I added some there as well. And this was a cell phone picture of one, one of these dogs had passed away and that's all that they had. So I extended the background, fixed their eyes, um, gave them a little bit more room at the bottom so, they're, uh, so the lighter color dog's paw, paws weren't cut off. Not the greatest image in the world being straight on like that, but that's all they had. So this is what we came up with. Another really pretty beach scene. Um, the photographer wanted all the bright areas toned down. So I just um, filled it in with the sunset color and added some of that warm tone to the highlights in the water. Here's another image where I did a lot of work in the background. Um, they liked the trees and things that were, that were back there, but I toned down a lot of the speculars. And there was um, a building on the left showing through all that white and they wanted that gone. So I ended up just turning that into soft greenery that's in the background and ended up with this nice portrait of this little boy. Um, a lot of times when we have solid concrete like this, I'm also going to go in and add a little bit of um, texture so that it's not so flat and then also add a little bit of um, color accents in it as well. This was a pretty big family group. This is one that would have taken a while, Michael. Um, you can see all the, the people in it and a um, couple of them had patterned shirts, which drive me crazy. Um, so sometimes the patterns that they want, if it's a super tight pattern, I, I tell the client, I said, you know, this is going to be almost impossible um, to paint in this particular style and keep it, keep the super tight patterns. And a lot of times it's a checked shirt or a tight plaid that I'm just, I'm going to tell them, I'm sorry, it's going to be solid. <laughs> uh, but this is what we've got. Um, really nice warm colors. Um, got rid of a lot of the reflection, uh, highlight reflections in the mirror, toned down the bright lamp, um, toned down the white staircase behind the, the man in the, the pink shirt. Um, I think this one ended up being a, a 30 by 40 as well. Okay, now I'm going to get into, oh, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, no questions. We're gonna go into um, selling portrait paintings in a digital world. And this is actually an article that um, I wrote that our state association, SEPA, when it was still around and had a magazine, they um, published and um, it's also something that I send to my, my new clients um, on, the, on a first time, um, commission and um, it seems to help a lot of people um, with how to sell these things. And number one is naming that product line. I know a lot of us have um, a different product line name for your different finishes. Like if it's just a, a straight photograph, it has one name. If it's a little bit more finished, it has another name. And I think this has been going on with professional photographers uh, for, for years. And um, this is no different. Um, what do you call yours? Is the masterpiece, the masterpiece collection, or I've got some clients that call it the artist signature series. 
something like that that really sets it apart from your regular photographic products. And it, it's something that's going to um, come across as the very top of your product line. So your whatever you name it, it, it has to say that. Choosing an image. Pretty much what makes a great portrait is going to make a great painting. And we always stress simple clothes, good posing and lighting, good composition, you know, the stuff that, that's always good for a portrait. We tell our clients keeping it simple um, is going to keep this from being dated in a few years. I mean, we look at clothes styles and we see hairstyles and you know hairstyles are, are going to change and clothes styles are going to change but if if we can keep things classic it's going to keep keep it from looking dated um if you are don't have a client in mind and you're going to do a sample which is something that i absolutely recommend it's difficult to sell this if you don't have something to show them um, keep in mind your past clients. Do you have something um, from your files um, that you would love to have painted that you think would make a good sample? Um, you know, it could be anything from children, if you do a lot of children, to seniors, to business portraits. I'm working on a judge right now for, um, for a client, so it could be pretty much anything. Um, and something um, that the particular client may purchase from you when you're done using it as a sample because I also do recommend changing them out just to stay fresh. Um, that way you're going to make some money and not have samples taking up space. Um, oh, Dennis reminded me something. A, a session, uh, if we know um, a client is going to have um, a painting done, we're, we're going to treat the session where we discuss stuff um, a little bit differently. But most times, they are going to choose to do a painting after the fact. Having printed samples is super important. I can't stress that enough. If you've got someone that you really um, think might like a, a painting or someone that wants a painting and wants to see one and you don't have one to show them, it's going to be really difficult to sell. Um, you don't want to say, oh, wouldn't this be great as a 30 by 40 when they're just looking at it on a monitor. They, they really can't visualize that. Um, so it's this, the same the same applies just like a, a regular portrait sample um you really have to have those as well so this this is no different also um having a printed sample um having them displayed prominently is a very important thing as well. I have uh, photographers that all they sell um, are the paintings. And so their lobby is full of them. Or even if it's not all that they sell, they have it a very prominent place, very nicely lit um, in their lobbies. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where the angels are illuminating this beautiful painted portrait it's going to stand out so it really needs to have an important place and if you aren't working in a studio you still need to have one um, to take to clients if you're having a meeting with them about a commission and take an easel um, that makes a really nice presentation as well Pricing, that's a tricky one. And although this is a, it's a higher end product and it should reflect a higher end price, um, but that's one of those things that it's gonna be different for everyone. I have clients that 
um, mark up what I charge them two or three times. And then I have some who have more of a carriage trade and mark up what I charge 20 times. So it totally depends on your market and your area. And I think that in these days, it's becoming a lot more accepted for digitally produced paintings as long as we are explaining the process. Because I've had a lot of photographers tell me, oh, we don't even tell them it's digital. Um, but a lot of times they're, they're gonna ask. And all you have to do is justify the investment by telling them it is not the click of a button, that it is hand done, brush stroke by brush stroke, with a tablet and stylus. It's done just as um, by hand, just if you were doing it with a brush and um, actual paint. They're just different tools for um, the same outcome. As long as they know that you're not clicking a button, because if you think about it, a lot of, a lot of your clients, pretty much anybody anymore has uh, painting apps on their phone and on their computer and all they have to do is click a button So you have to make sure that they know the difference between that and a hand done piece like what we're talking about here and generally speaking especially now um, They're gonna be a lot more um, open to the idea of, of that kind of painting and especially when you tell them um, that there are hand embellishment um, available because that's totally different than a than a click of a button um, just finishing it um, the way that we finish it really makes a difference um, so we we want to give them something way above and beyond what they can do on their phone or on their on their computer and that's how you justify the price and now we get into printing um, since these are paintings there are really only two uh, substrates that I recommend. Um, the higher in the product, the higher in the substrate, with meaning canvas and the heavy matte fine art papers. If we have these beautiful paintings and we print them on photographic paper, that's, that's kind of a step backwards and it, it kind of doesn't make sense in the minds of our clients. So we want to really keep um, how we finish these higher end products um, to reflect the higher end aspect of it as well as the price. And the next is getting the word out. Um, so if you've ever been to a gallery opening, um, they kind of turn it into a big deal. It's like a party. They're showing you their new art that they have hanging in their gallery. Have a wine and cheese party. Have um, just a gathering of people um, send you can send out actual invitations digital invitations emails however you want to do it um, but just get the word out um, social media Facebook Instagram whatever else there is out there I know there's a lot of uh, social media platforms out there that I don't even know of um, but Dennis and I utilize um, Facebook and Instagram um, quite a bit um, so those are definitely um, ways to get the word out. The, it, by doing this, and you know, you might not sell a lot of uh, the, the painted commissions, but the more you talk about it, you're going to be the go-to person in your area. People are gonna talk about it. They're gonna say, oh yeah, Michael Collins is the place to go if you want a commission painting. So you put the buzz in people's heads. They know that you are the one to go to for this. And so when you're constantly doing it, it's going to get um, pushed into their brain to the point that they know to come to you, um, whether you sell them a lot. And also um, selling, uh, putting the word out there that you do these paintings and having them on your price list, it makes your next highest product line a lot more attractive. Generally speaking, if you, have, if you have things on your price list, if you have a low price, a medium price, and a high price, just 
human nature is people are going to go for the middle. So if you put another product line in there that is um, a lot more expensive, what used to be your expensive product line just became a lot more um, attractive and people will gravitate towards that. I'm gonna show you a painting progression um, from start to finish. Um, and this particular image is our Idaho Falls uh, Symphony conductor. And we just love him. He's, he's a, a wonderful young guy who is just so personable, so completely unlike most symphony conductors. Um, just will answer questions. He actually does a, a before kind of a thing, before uh, the symphony performs, and explains the music, explains um, the different pieces and parts of the music, the movements and so forth and stuff like that. He really makes it interesting and and our our community just loves him. Um, and this was for a promotion for the symphony and he particularly liked the fall scene on our Snake River here in Idaho Falls. Um, Idaho Falls is on the Snake River, and this is um, a part of it right here in the fall with the beautiful colors. This is our before image, and Dennis told him to just think of a piece of music in your head and just start conducting like the symphonies in front of you. And so this is what he ended up um, picking. And when I start with a, with a painting in Corel, it's very similar to how a, a a lot of painters start their paintings. They call it a muck up. They just blend in a bunch of color and a bunch of tone and then start slowly building detail um, out of it. And here's where I started. Here's a little bit more refined with all of that. Here I've kind of blocked in uh, the rocks, uh, the lava rocks on the river and the river and a little bit of his suit. So it's just becoming a, a little bit more detailed. Here we've got um, a little bit more closer up so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing with the tone and the color. Here's just a little bit more with the skin tone. Starting on the face, doing his hair. And just slowly, ever so slowly, building in color and tone and a little bit more detail, a little bit at a piece, a little bit at a time. And I asked, I, ha I had an idea, and I asked him for his favorite piece of music, and it's the pastoral movement from Beethoven's. I forgot which one it was. Is it? No, it's not the fifth. Um, I can't remember which piece it is, but this is the piece of music that is his favorite part. So I took this and warped it because I had this idea in mind that I'm going to put it into the, the painting, um, like he's thinking about it, and it's just going through his mind. So I've kind of put this in here. Here's a little bit of more close-up, a little bit more detailed, some more detail, and I, and I love texture. Um, when painting, I love bristly texture and kind of grungy, grisly texture. And so this is the, the final piece that we ended up with. And um, this goes with us. Um, Dennis is the official photographer for the symphony. And so he's the only one that allowed there with a camera. Um, so um, we get to go. And when we do go, we take this and put it on easel and it's right at the um, inside entrance when you go in to hear the symphony. And here I'm gonna go through um, my process for um, printing and finishing. And this is my old printer. I love this printer. I had it for um, eight years and then it finally died. I have a new one now and I love it too. Um, but I'm going to go through uh, my um, finishing. This is particular canvas for a photographer that um, I painted coming off the printer. And I've got it on my work table and I'm going to coat it. Um, I use um, a liquid coating 
And I roll mine instead of spraying it um, because I found that it's a lot less messy doing that than, than spraying it. So I pour it in a cup and I've got a paint roller and I use a particular type of uh, paint roller, not the paint roller, but the, yeah. the little pad that goes on it. I get the ones that are for cabinets that say lint free. Um, because if not, they're going to be little pieces of fiber all over my canvas when I'm done. And then there's going to be a lot of bad words involved. Um, so I found out that using these lint-free um, roller pads um, make my life a lot easier. So I pour it on in strips and just start rolling it. Then after I do that, I have two levels of embellishment. The first level is clear acrylic that I brush on, and that's what I'm doing here. My second level is the clear acrylic plus oil paint accents. So um, there's, there's two levels. Most of my clients go for this one because they can get it back sooner. Oil paint takes a, a little while to dry, um, and so a lot of photographers I found are quite impatient. Um, me being one of them, so I get it. Um, so this is me going through, and I'll go over the whole thing. Um, I hope you like my, my fancy brush. I love this brush, and the handle broke. So this is duct tape that I have taped to the end of my brush. That's how I've made it last. And now this is a little bit of um, a smaller brush that I'm using for some detail areas. And I go over the, the canvas um, following the brush strokes that I did in Corel. And the, the guy before, um, they did not do the oil. Um, so that's where I stopped on that one. But this is how I would continue um, to proceed with finishing it um, with the oil. Um, so this one, this little girl, she's already had the clear acrylic applied. And so now I'm going over it with um, oil paint. Here again, my fancy palette. I hope you like it. Next is the stretcher frame. Um, I get my, um, I order my stretcher bars. Um, these come, where do I get these? Um, Jerry's Artorama. I get these from Jerry's Artorama. I get my gallery bars from um, Stretcher Bar Warehouse, which is in California. I can't remember the name of it. But here's, here are the tools I'm gonna use to put my stretcher frame together. As you can see, it's got um, dovetail joints, and I'm gonna use um, wood glue and a T-square and a rubber mallet. So I'm halfway putting together my um, the joints for the, stretcher bars and I'm leaving a little bit of space so that I can glue them. And I'm about to beat it into submission and I tap on the edges in, until I get them um, about um, as squared up eyeballing it. And then I get the actual T-square out and um, square it up and make any adjustments um, if needed. This is the back of my canvas. I'm holding up to the light and I am marking um, my corners so that when I lay this canvas face down on the table, I know where to put the stretcher frame. Otherwise it's a guessing game and it's, it's gonna be a mess. So um, I have, if there's enough time, I have a, a video um, showing how I stretch a canvas if you want me to show it or I could be done. It's up to you. Uh, we got plenty of time. Okay, then I will. We're, we're on the West Coast, so we're oh. an hour ahead of you. <laughs> okay, where is it? Here it is. Just questions. Is there any questions at this point before I start this? Um, the one question I think we answered it was, what was the first treatment that was applied with the lint-free roller? That's a coating. It, I use a satin coating. Um, it, that, 
whether I do a painting or not, all canvases get coated. It's a UV coating and then it's also just a little bit of an extra layer of protection to protect it from damage. Okay, so here I have my canvas laying face down on a table. Um, I have my stapler in my canvas stretching pliers. It's not showing right now. No, it's not. Can you see it? Nope. Okay, I wonder if I have to share it separately. You might, yeah, if you're, if you're yeah, sharing. Share and then reshare. Okay, how do I get out of this? Okay. How do I get out of this? Help. Well, sure, now you want me. I don't know how to get out of it. Here, I'll get you out of it. There, you're out of it. No, I'm not. Okay. Share, share screen. Again. Share screen. Okay, here we go. That's weird that did that. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? We can yeah. see it now. Okay, yay. Start. So let me start over. Okay, here's my canvas laying on the table. Remember, I marked the corners so I know where to lay it. I'm pointing it where the my marks are so I can lay my stretcher frame down on it and know exactly where to put it. And when I start my stapling, I'm gonna start in the middle on a long edge like that. And then I'm gonna turn it around and go exact opposite and you're going to notice a buckle in the canvas because I'm pulling that sucker really hard. That's how it's going to get nice and tight. Then I'm going to go to the short end and do the same thing. When I do that and then I go opposite, that keeps it from twisting on the stretcher frame. I found that out the hard way. You can see a lot of the, the buckles in the canvas, but after I'm done, that, that's all pulled out and all flat. Going through and just doing the edges. And if you noticed, I didn't go all the way to the edge. See, when I start right here, I leave a space. And that's so that I can do the corner in a minute. And then um, i show you how to do that in just a second. So do you mount these for the photographers or do you send them the, just the canvas? They're, stre they're stretched on a stretcher frame ready to, for them to frame. Okay. And then I'm gonna make a, another round and then just do staples in between so that there's no gapping. I know this is super boring. Now I'm gonna do a corner. Now you can see why I didn't put that staple at the edge. So I can fold that back. And I do a double pleat. I do one pleat there, staple it, and then do another pleat over the top of that. Couple of questions. Um, are you doing yeah. this on a piece of felt to protect the canvas? It's on a blanket. And then also, what is the tool you use to pull the canvas? Canvas stretching pliers. Canvas stretching pliers. Yep. Uh, let's see, share screen. And then somebody else was also asking, what is the acrylic product you use for the canvas? Is the acrylic a... part is um, Golden's um, gel, heavy, 
gloss, heavy extra, what is it called? Dennis is going to, no, the gel, the gel. It's um, Golden's acrylic, it comes in a tub. It's Golden's Extra Heavy Gel Gloss. Thank you. And I don't apply it super heavy because the heavier you apply it, the glossier it gets. And I'm just not crazy about a glossy canvas. It's hard to look at. Um, and then, um, then the oil paint goes on top of that. Um, the oil paint has to have um, a, a layer underneath it. Um, acrylic has to go first and then oil. You can't go the other way around. It's, um, remember, fat over lean. It, you can mix, um, you can do a water-based product first, which is the acrylic, and then you can do oil paint on top of that, but you can never do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Just like painting a house. Um, and I am having my July special actually started this back when they declared a pandemic um, just to try to help all the photographers get on their feet and maybe help out their clients as well um, by offering them a bit of a special. Um, I normally do it for the first two weeks in July, but I started this back in March. Um, and this is going to run through July 31st. And... It's 30% off the commission, um, which is about $150 off an average commission. Um, so it's a really good time to do it um, if that's what you're interested in. And all of my contact is right here on this slide. My phone number, my email, um, Facebook, um, Sherry Fitzgerald Hammond, Instagram, Sherry Hammond. You can see it right there on the, on the bottom right. And my Facebook page is Art by Sherry. Um, on Facebook as well. So that's that's what I got. All right, a couple more questions popped up. Can you paint with acrylic paint instead of oil? I do not like to on something that I have already done um, that I have to match to because acrylic, um, it will appear that it matches, but acrylic dries darker than it goes on. So it makes it really really difficult to match um, any colors that I'm painting on top of like her skin tone um, for me to match it it would be a guessing game I would have to go okay well this color looks good let's make it a little bit lighter and then cross my fingers it's the right tone and oil paints don't change colors when they dry so that's why I prefer um, the oil paint over the acrylic okay. but yes you could it's just a lot more difficult all righty. Any other questions out there, folks? Now would be a good time to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question come up. Do, do you just paint the highlights or do you paint all the different colors and variations? I go through and do accents on every area. I do accents in the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. Um, it's not a complete overpaint, um, but I'm going to hit every area on the piece. And one question is, why Corel over Photoshop? That's just how I learned. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I started doing Corel back in 99. So that's way before Photoshop started um, having any kind of capabilities for that. And another person asked, um, what is the original satin coating again? It's Lex Jets Sunset Coating, and I use a satin. Okay. And do you paint over the picture, or do you start with a white canvas? I use the photograph as my base so that I get likeness and things like that. Um, and I will clone some of the tone and the color, but I'm going through and adding my own um, hand-done accents along the way. Okay. A lot of good questions out there. Yeah.
And do you know what the realm of prices that photographers are charging out there? Like I mentioned in, um, when I was going through all, all the ways for, for selling, depends on your market. Um, a, a, a good rule of thumb that I heard from a fellow photographer is take whatever your highest priced canvas product is and multiply it by three. Um, it's definitely not scientific, um, but it's a starting point. So you'd make sure that it is higher um, than that, that other highest product line that you have. Um, but like I said, the average that a professional photographer is, is going to do is around 550 to 600 and that's wholesale pricing. Um, some of my photographer clients, because of their areas, they're going to maybe double or triple it because that's all their market is going to bear where they are. And then I have some who are in um, carriage trade areas and they'll take what I charge them in, in 20 times what um, what I charge them. So it just, it, it's going to vary um, from market to market. That's key to okay, any other questions out there? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Going once. And a question came up, what are the range of prices that you charge? Uh, well, if anybody wants my pricing, um, just to go send, directly through you. Yeah, just send me an, an email. It, it's really hard to say because it depends on what it depends on the image and the size. Exactly. You can't just work there's artwork, the there's artwork prices, um, and then there's um, printing prices and finishing prices. So it's it just depends on the image and the size of or in the substrate that, that you'd be going with. Cool. But you can email me. It's um, you can see on the that very bottom little banner. It says Sherry at ArtbySherry.net, or or you can find me on Facebook. Or you can contact me, and I've got her information as well. There you go. But I won't share it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sherry, thank you very much for sharing your information with us tonight. Um, amazing, amazing stuff. Well, and thank you. I appreciate you having me. It was a lot of fun. I hope um, your members got something out of it. Well, if they didn't, I did. So <laughs> that's all that matters. And Dennis, thanks for your help as well. I'm just supporting staff in the back. <laughs> and you do it well. Do you want to type in the um, fabric or address? In the okay. So if um, anybody can think of any questions later that you didn't think of now, feel free to contact me and I will do my best to answer it for you. All righty. Thank you very much. I'm going to terminate the recording at this point. Then you can ask all the 